everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar. I'm Cheryl Hart. I'm the Vice President of Coalition of Refuge Friends and Advocates. We're really delighted to have you here today to learn more about how to be an effective storyteller. Um, the presenters today will be Joan Patterson, who is President of Coalition of Refuge Friends and Advocates, Amy Arndt, the Executive Director of Friends of Ottawa in Ohio, and uh, Lisa Jansen Reese with the Friends of Wichita Mountains in Oklahoma. And Sue Wilder is going to be, who's also on the Corfo board, is going to be helping me keep up with the chat room and your questions and hand raises and all of those kinds of things. So without any further ado, we'll get started and I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thanks, Cheryl. And I am going to start sharing my screen, which as everybody on the Corfo board knows, if I can do it, it's a miracle. Hopefully you are all seeing it now. Can yes, everybody yes. see it? Yes. Fantastic. Okay, so I want to thank everybody for joining us today and good day to everyone. Um, as Cheryl said, we're going to be talking about storytelling. And the reason that we wanted to address this topic now is that you know, we know that many groups are trying to just reinvigorate their organization after COVID. And there's really, we want to have a push this coming year to really try to bring more attention to refuges and hatcheries. And we just feel that having our stories pulled together is a valuable tool to help us accomplish these goals. You know, I've had the opportunity to go to Capitol Hill a number of times as a member of a friend's organization and what I've discovered is that a good story is a powerful tool for capturing my lawmakers' attention and to motivate them to take action. So we just thought if we can have a discussion about storytelling, it can help push our both the refuges and hatcheries forward. So as Cheryl said, here are our presenters. If you ever have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. The things that we want to cover this afternoon are why is storytelling effective, the essential building blocks of an effective story, um, share some examples with you of stories that should be part of every group's repertoire, and then have a discussion about where do you find these stories and how do you go about sharing them. And then Lisa's going to talk too about what, how to go and determine the outcomes and measures for your story. Um, we're hoping that this will take 60 minutes, but hey, if you want to stay around for an additional half hour and talk to us about your stories and just, you know, share things, uh, we, can, we can stay on for a total of 90 minutes. For today, we're going to ask that if you've got questions or comments that you put them in the chat. And as Cheryl said, she and Sue will be monitoring them. So. What I would love to hear you guys put in the chat is why do you think stories are effective? If everyone could just take a minute and throw their comments in there, that would be great. And I could sing some dentist music while you're doing that, but I don't think you want to hear that. So. Hey, um, Cheryl and Sue, since I can't easily see the chat, would you, if there's anything in there, please share it? Sure, I'll, I'll start out too, and then we'll switch back and forth if that works for you. The first comment is stories make connections. Okay, yes, they do. And that is just so important. Anything else? Sue, are you there? Did I lose Sue? Are you on mute, Sue? Might have lost. I am. I'm on mute, of course. Hey, uh, it also says develop re relationships. Mm hmm They provide a human connection. Yeah. Great. Uh, as humans, we thrive on storytelling. Stories go back to sitting around the campfire. <laughs> yes. Um, you skipped a couple, though. I'm going to go back and pick those up. Stories relate to people and connect people's hearts to the refuge. Yeah. They also provide a better bonding with visitors. Stories help us to feel connected. 
and people easily relate to a story. Stories bring issues to a local level, easy to understand. Wow, great one. Oh, they're great. These are, they're coming in fast. They're terrific. It paints, yeah. It paints a picture of what you are explaining. Yes. Oh, you guys, these are absolutely wonderful. And we will capture all of these in the chat. Thank you so much. I just want to just try to summarize some of these things that you guys have been putting in the chat. So really, as you guys have said, effective stories really engage your listeners. There, you, you connect with them. You create that emotional connection with them. And you start building a relationship with them. All of these things are just so important. And as someone said, um, yeah, the stories are a part of us. You know, cave drawings and everything else, they're always a part of us. All our significant events in our lives, you know, whether it's the birth of a child, child joining our family, someone passing away, we talk about stories in those situations. We think in terms of the stories. And as you guys have mentioned, a really good story is going to engage the listener. It's going to connect with them. Okay. It's going to activate their senses. You've painted that picture for them. They understand what you're talking about. They can, they can feel it. And it activates their emotion. And when those things happen, you do make the connection. And they're also more likely to take action. It allows when you've got a good story and you know something about that audience, you're allowing them to enter your story where they're at, okay? That's really important. A study was done a number of years ago on, on people who serve on juries. And then how they come about coming to their conclusions. And the study found that most jurors are going to construct a story based on the facts offered to them in the case, but they're going to construct their own story. And then they're going to compare that to what the lawyers are saying. And the jurors will side with whosoever story more closely matches their own. And that's what we need to be doing is matching that listeners um, where we think their story is at. So stories also help us to remember the facts. They are more engaging than data points. Now, another example for me. So I've had the opportunity to go up to Capitol Hill and testify before the House Interior Subcommittee. And this day that I went to testify, there were hundreds of people there. You each got like five minutes. And there were a lot of leaders from the green groups there and they're getting up and they're sharing all sorts of facts, all sorts of information. I'm sitting in the back row going, I am up a creek without a paddle. But my testimony highlighted the needs of our local refuge and it included a few stories. One being about a young mother of four who attended our fall festival and she donated $1 to our friends organization. And her young son explained to me that she wanted us to have this dollar because she loved the plants. She loved the place. You know, it was a wonderful place for her to bring her young family and for them just to relax and enjoy. Her donation was only a dollar, but it was absolutely priceless because what her son also relayed to us that they were homeless. There had been a natural disaster in the area just a few days before. She brought her kids to this refuge and to show her appreciation, she donated $1 to us. When our congressman and his staff heard that story, they connected with this young mother. And our congressman went on to share that story to try to push for additional funding for the refuge system. He even shared the story with Fish and Wildlife Service to help push them for it you know that you have got an effective stories, a story when it's remembered by others, it's passed on and it pushes people to take action. So just in summary, why is a story effective? When it creates that emotional connection, as you guys have said, it allows the listener to enter the story where they are. It's more engaging than any data points or abstract ideas. And it's more likely to be accurately remembered and it's more likely to get people to take action. Okay. Wanna just, there's another little bit of research for you. 
but there was a study done in which the participants were given each given five dollars and were instructed to distribute it to three charities based on that charity's outreach material. And these results actually surprised me. Okay, so of that $5, $2.86 went to the outreach material that was just story. And you drop down to $1.14 for that outreach material that is most statistics. And then it's only $1.43 if it's a story combined with statistics. I thought that would be a lot higher, but it just shows you how powerful the stories are. Okay. Any questions or anything in the chat, Cheryl or Sue? Not yet. Okay. So why so are there? There is a question, a citation. Is there a citation for the study? Oh. I'll have to go and look back at my notes, but I'll see if I okay. can find it, okay? Okay, so why is storytelling effective? Because when you share your stories, you can acquire the resources that you need to accomplish the mission. You know, whether it be funds, volunteers, board members, you know, uh, more people visiting your refuge or hatchery, more members, increasing your social media following, getting people to advocate for your refuge. And there's just so many ways that you can use their, your stories. Oh, but there are some basic building blocks of a story that you should be aware of, okay? It's the character, your trajectory or plot to the story, making sure that your story is authentic, that you're using or showing emotions that are action-oriented, and that there's the hook. Approximately 99% of all good stories are going to focus in on a single character because people, as you guys said earlier, they want to connect with people. Not necessarily an organization, but the person in that organization. You know, and that character in your story, it can be yourself. It can be a member of the community, a visitor, a donor, a volunteer, someone who founded your organization, a staff member, a board member. Try to make it about a character. And the reason for that is characters are, you know, they help you to frame the story because we all have some basic universal needs. And that helps to connect the character in your story to the listener. It's things like uh, acceptance, belonging, safety, self respect, independence, and growth. You focus in on the emotional or intangible needs rather than the physical or tangible stuff, okay? That stuff can go into report. I've seen this used really effectively. Um, one of my kids, it was payback time. I went to visit her and she had volunteered for a UNICEF gala. Well, that means mom needs to come along and volunteer too. And I just was amazed at what UNICEF was able to do with their stories. They were doing a project where they were putting water pumps in rural communities in Africa, but they didn't talk about those water pumps. What they talked about was a young woman who would now no longer need to spend the majority of her day gathering water for her family. She would now be able to go to school because the water was, you know, easily accessible. She was going to be able to go to school. Her future were brighter. In two minutes, we heard how having that water pump in her community would address her needs for safety, self-respect, independence, and growth. She was relatable. She was also relatable because she was three-dimensional. The story was about not just about the need for accessible water. It was about her education and a more promising future. I was amazed. Within two hours, they raised $2 million. Okay. The other thing stories need to have is your plot. You know, this doesn't have to be something sequential, but it, you need a plot because it's the plot that's the oxygen of your story. It shows how that character's world was thrown out of balance and what was done in order to be able to achieve their goals. As we mentioned earlier, the story needs to be authentic. Don't do it, George Santos, okay? So if you can tell your story, it's just that much more powerful. Use your own voice. You go in for the details to really 
set that story in time and place and you're trying to get someone to experience it using all of their senses. To get people to take action or to get really involved, you need to use emotional words, okay? You need to evoke emotions and you're looking for those that are high arousal, positive emotions. There are things like awe, excitement, amusement, humor. And we know from our experience with Facebook and also anger and anxiety also motivate people to take action. It's things like sadness or contentment. You don't want to use those. Those aren't going to take action. For us who are part of refuges and hatcheries, hey, the opportunity to get people out onto a refuge or to the hatchery to see these places, to see the awe, the excitement, the amusement, things that go on and to express to them your anxiety about lousy budgets. These are the types of things that can get your listener to take action, but make sure you have that hook. Why do you want them to take action? What is it that you want them to do? Okay, why is this issue important? You know, why is it important to fund UNICEF so water pumps can go in? It's because it means somebody has a better future, okay? Why is it important to raise refuge system funding? Because it means better habitat for the survival of a species. It means that a school child can get out onto that refuge and be in amazement at the wildlife they see. There are some basic stories in your rep that you want in your repertoire. And they are stories about why are you involved? Why is someone involved? Why are they gonna spend their time? doing um, anything on a refuge or hatchery. The roots of your organization. Why does your organization exist? Why does that refuge exist? Why does the hatchery exist? Also the impact. What sort of impact can you have or do you have? Why is that impact important? Stressing the why here, guys. You need to always think about why this, why, um, whatever issue you're trying to relate is important, express that. And then also it's important to have that thank you. Why did that donation make a difference? Why did someone's action make a difference? Let people know why these things are important. I am now going to turn it over to Lisa, who is gonna share with you a story about involvement. Lisa? Thanks, Joan. Um, so I want to talk about Bill Shreve. He's the character um, in this story. That's the guy in the ghillie suit that you're seeing in the large picture. And that beautiful girl with her head poking out of prairie grass is his faithful companion, Maggie. If you are of the right age, you're already singing, wake up, Maggie. I think I got something to say to you. Um, Bill is retired military, as are a lot of the people in this particular area, and he recently retired from his second career as civil service um, at our installation hospital. So Bill is very, very involved on our local refuge. He takes photos for um, the staff. Uh, he also takes photos for the friends group. He's teaching uh, classes on photography for us, and um, he serves on our communications committee for the Friends of the Wichita's. Um, additionally, Bill is an officer in the Wichita Wildlife Photographic Society. Say that three times fast. What a mouthful. Um, and he takes Maggie who is a, a registered therapy dog to all of the local hospitals and nursing homes with the group Pause for Love. So when I, I think, as Joan said earlier, when volunteers really share their own particular story in a wide variety of groups, it really extends the reach of your particular group and it's more likely that they're going to seek you out to become a member. Any questions about Bill, ghillie suits? <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
then I think I'm going to be followed by Ms. Cheryl, who's going to talk about that frog. Uh, yes, there's been a big buildup among the presenters because they haven't heard my, my frog story. So I got asked about why I was involved with the Friends, and this is the way it happened. I was uh, on a Hill visit, and our representative, David Wu, who was very instrumental in the founding of Tualatin River National Wildlife Refuge and the building of the visitor center and the administration building there. So he, he has a big impact on our refuge. And um, he was one of the people that I was there to visit that day. And he actually met with us, which was a little unique in my experience. Usually you meet with AIDS, which is great. But the congressman himself actually met with us and he turned to me and he said, so why are you involved with the refuge? I hadn't prepared an involvement story. So anybody who knows me knows that I never am at a loss for word and I'm pretty, pretty adept at flying by the seat of my pants. So I told him I was born and raised in rural Idaho and I was probably hyperactive before being hyperactive was a thing so I spent a lot of time outdoors for my parents sanity sake and now I live in Portland Oregon in an urban area and I have two little grandsons who are growing up in Portland and I want them to be able to grow up with frogs in their pockets and mud between their toes a year or so later, when the congressman was getting ready to leave office, he was in the district, and I made an appointment to go talk with him again to thank him for all of his efforts on the behalf of the refuge. When I walked in the door of that appointment, his first comment to me was, so do those little grandsons still have frogs in their pockets and mud between their toes? If you think your stories don't have impact, they do. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure who I'm supposed to turn it over to next. I'm going next. You get okay, me back Joan. again. So Cheryl, thank you, Cheryl and Lisa. Cheryl asked me, since I was involved at Tualatin River a long time ago, she asked me to share with you the root story for the Tualatin River National Wildlife Refuge. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with Tualatin, it is about 25 miles southwest of the city of Portland, Oregon. And when the community was looking to create this refuge, um, Fish and Wildlife Service wasn't overly enthusiastic about it. The idea of putting a wildlife refuge so close to development just wasn't terribly thrilling. But you may be aware that Tualatin is now a designated urban refuge, so things have really changed. But back in the 1980s, Jim Rapp, he's one of my conservation heroes that most of you probably have never heard of, but he was the manager of the city of Sherwood. And as manager, he had a few problems. First of all, as you can see from this satellite image, and this is a fairly new image, sorry, I couldn't find something from the 80s. But you can see that there is a highway going through here. Up here is the city of Tigard. Over here is the city of Tualatin. And down here is the city of Sherwood. Sherwood was a fairly small community, four to 5,000 people, very agricultural base. You could go back down 99 and one side is a dairy farm. Another side is an onion field. There's Christmas tree farms, there's vineyards, there's, you know, all sorts of potato fields, just a wonderful place. But the community was very concerned about this urban sprawl and thought that it's gonna continue and it's not, we're never gonna know the difference between Tigard and Sherwood and that they would lose their unique identity. And so it was like, do we either lose it or do we create something new? What are we gonna do here? So Jim was sort of tasked to solve this problem and then an additional conflict arises. There is an individual family that moves up from California. They lived next to the San Luis Valley National Wildlife Refuge, and their land became basically useless because of contamination by heavy metals. That was the result of some of the floodplain practices, and they ended up suing, if my understanding, both the federal and the state government. And then they moved up to the Sherwood area, and they started buying up different parcels of land. So this individual came to Jim and said, I want to develop this land. Jim turned to him and very politely said, 
You can't. It's part of the floodplain. This individual is a little cantankerous and you know, wasn't gonna take no for an answer or needed to find some other way that he could get his money back out of this land. And he remembered about wildlife refuges. And together they came up with the idea of the creation of a wildlife refuge that would encompass the floodplain that extends between the city of Tigard and Sherwood. And I don't know if you can clearly see, but all through here, this land has been designated to be part of the Tualatin River National Wildlife Refuge. But that only came apart, uh, came to be because Jim really saw the vision. And he created stories about the roots of this idea, the impact that it would have, the groups that were involved. And he got you, the farmers, on board, he got the community on board, he got the adjacent cities on board because the refuge would be used to store flood water. They wouldn't get flooded so hard. And then it just so happened that Senator Hatfield, who was in charge of the appropriations committee at the time, his residents overlooked this floodplain. He was able to get all of these people on board and supportive of the refuge. That turned Fish and Wildlife Service around. That also meant that the refuge was finally established or it was authorized in 1982. And part of the group that Jim invigorated about this idea, this, this couple turned around and donated 12 acres to Fish and Wildlife Service in order to get the refuge established. And with that, Senator Hatfield was able to make sure that money went to that refuge for land acquisition. So here's a story of a man who really had a vision for what this refuge could be. And I bet you he had a vision that it could be a wonderful urban refuge before that concept even hit Fish and Wildlife Service. But there, he had the vision, he had the stories, he had the grit and determination to make this happen. And that, what happened was, Am I going to get my screen to move forward? Here, there's Tualatin River National Wildlife Refuge at this point. Okay, I am now going to turn it over to Lisa. Can you tell us how the Friends of Wichita had an impact here? I absolutely can. And in this particular story, um, our central character is not a person, it's this house. This is the Ferguson house. It doesn't predate the refuge. Uh, our refuge predates the state of Oklahoma, but this house was on the refuge very, very early on, 1927. Um, it was built by Ben and Margaret Ferguson, and they, along with their 10 children, grew hay, raised cattle, planted a fruit orchard. And then in 1930, Ben built a small gas station and a store nearby so that they could sell those fruits and vegetables to um, the area uh, folks and the miners who were working on the installation, um, or excuse me, on the refuge. Over the years, the property went back and forth as being listed on the refuge and then being listed on Fort Sill. And that's because it sits right on the border between those two federal entities. Um, at one point, uh, it was used as staff headquarters for the refuge or staff quarters for the refuge. Um, and one of our lifetime friends, Bobby Williamson, actually lived in Ferguson House as a small child. Unfortunately, um, in 2010, the house was engulfed in a wildfire that started on Fort Sill and quickly spread to the refuge. With the help of a matching grant um, from the McMahon Foundation in Lawton, um, the Friends of the Wichita's raised $70,000 for an exterior restoration of the historic home. It is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, our Friends group 
coordinated volunteer crews of soldiers from Fort Sill to do some of the removal of the burnt out wood portions um, of the home. They assisted um, in collaboration with the State Historic Preservation Office, SHPO. Um, they um, completed grounds maintenance um, while this entire um, deconstruction and, and then renovation was completed. Um, and the friends ultimately purchased and place the historic marker that sits outside the home. Um, the Ferguson House is so important to all of the area because it is um, made of cannonball architecture, uh, a building style using local pink granite cobblestones that you can see there in the picture. And I have to tell you, it is so iconic on the refuge that the most frequently asked question that we get through our social media platforms is whether or not the cabin is now for rent um, for visitors who come to see the refuge. Um, one of the friends when we were first doing this was asking me um, about uh, talk a little bit about the matching grant and how that came about. Um, and it, one of the benefits of being in, I think, this rural community that we're in in Oklahoma is that everybody knows everybody. And so we had some friends board members who were friends with uh, board members from the McMahon Foundation. And so when that fire happened, they immediately started talking about how can we save that home. And that's all I have. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Um, Amy, would you like to share? Absolutely. So here is an example of using a story as part of a direct mail campaign. This particular example was from a direct mail appeal last fall for Friends of Ottawa. Um, throughout the year, I kind of do informal interviews and gather stories from interns, donors, volunteers, pretty much anybody who will talk to me, uh, just to have an arsenal of content available to help us accomplish all of our asks, um, in this case, to raise funds. This story was a quote from an intern named Brooke that we had last summer. Um, she had just graduated high school and became an operations intern, which basically gave her access to like all of the refuge staff and she was exposed to all sorts of jobs and tasks around the refuge. The photo was shared from our amazing assistant refuge manager, Carl, who is really great about snapping photos in the moment and sharing them with me because he knows that I like to do this kind of thing. Um, but he captured this great photo of Brooke driving the airboat. Who gets to do that? She thought it was the coolest thing ever and made um, and the whole internship experience fresh out of high school, helped her decide that she wants to go to college and is now enrolled in an environmental science program at the University of Toledo. So we're super excited to watch her do great things in this world. Um, our impact here is facilitating the advancement of youth and conservation. But it's also, if you flip to the next slide, Joan, um, her story was used as part of this direct mail campaign, as I said, and that raised over $21,000 for our intern program so far this year. So really it's storytelling in its most traditional sense, I think. Um, the logic behind storytelling and fundraising is that we know, Joan mentioned this earlier, we like to give to people, we like to give to places, and we like to give to projects. For these direct appeals, we have used several people stories or people characters that have been really effective. Um, one was through the eyes of an eight-year-old who visited the refuge during monarch migration and describes the experience and what it meant to him, and that helped to raise funds for our land acquisition and restoration campaign. Um, a couple projects were based off of visitor surveys where people had indicated that they wanted specific things at the refuge, like pull-offs in the wildlife drive or a shuttle, um, things that refuge staff wanted too, so we worked together and made it happen. Um, Someone in chat asked earlier if a character can be an animal instead of a person. Yes. One story we did for a direct meal appeal letter was from the perspective of an eagle. 
And I've seen where another nonprofit did one from the perspective of a bicycle. Lisa did one from, you know, perspective of a house, but perspective of a bicycle. This was uh, a nonprofit that was accepting old bikes and sprucing them up for underserved children. And the intro, I wish I had it. Um, the intro was something like, they tossed me on the curb. And it's like, that gets your attention pretty immediately. Um, and then it went on to say how they felt being discarded. And about halfway through, you realize that it is a bicycle telling the story and um, how they were given new life by someone who stopped to pick it up and eventually donated it to this nonprofit that was sprucing them up for underserved kids. So very impactful kind of things that you can tell. Um, there's really lots of ways that you can tell stories in fundraising. All of them kind of follow the basic template of here's the problem, you can be the hero, here's what you need to do. So you can also um, use stories when saying thanks, which is what Lisa is going to share with you next. Thanks, Amy. Um, so we talked earlier about thank yous and that that's one of the types of stories you wanna have in your arsenal. Um, for the friends, we utilize membership Mondays and we express our thanks regularly all throughout the year. Sometimes we'll highlight one particular member or volunteer and at other times we'll highlight a group or a committee and tell their story and thank them. At the end of the year, we like to send out a general thank you and we pair that with an iconic um, image from the refuge. This is the, the Jed Johnson Tower built by the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 1930s. Um, everybody who has been to Fort Sill or been to uh, the Wichita Mountains has passed the Jed Johnson Tower. Uh, and so they all recognize it. And we thanked our volunteers uh, and our donors throughout the year for empowering uh, all of us to be able to um, accomplish trail maintenance, community outreach, wildlife surveys, environmental education, campground support, facilities improvement, and the ever-present battle of invasive eradication on the refuge. Um, the thank you is followed up with an ask um, always, and that is if you aren't currently a member of the Friends of the Wichita's, we hope you'll consider joining us in preserving and protecting this extraordinary landscape and the wildlife that call it home. And I think Ms. Joan is going to talk a little bit more about um, the ask um, and making sure that we always pair a story with an ask. For an action. Um, yeah, I'll just touch. I uh, would just touch on that. Um, so, so I have. I'm just personally. I'm one of these people who tells the story and then forgets to do the ask. And um, I find that for myself, I have to almost construct the ask before I can do the rest of the story. So it is just so incredibly important to make sure that you do have that ask and it's clear people know what you're looking for. So we thought at this point we would open things up a little bit. And one of the things that we wanted to share with you or talk with you all about and hear from you is where do you think you would go to find those stories? And Amy, do you want to take this part over? Yeah, I sure can. Um, so we wanted to brainstorm. I, I've worked with elementary school kids for a good chunk of my life prior to the nonprofit world. And we always told them to put on their listening ears or their thinking caps. So now it's time for your thinking caps. Um, so use the chat feature and type in your thoughts because we want to hear from you. And um, my goal, hopefully we can work with Eden and make this happen. Joan, technology. I know. Um, <laughs> Let me move in a cursor and I can wipe out the whole presentation. Sorry, folks. <laughs> My goal is to um, work with Eden and get all this put together into a document, too, so that you guys can go back and look at it and kind of get some ideas going forward. Um, but yeah, first question for you. Um, where do you look for stories or, or who can you ask for your stories? Go ahead and type your responses in. Personal and we so have a couple, we, yeah. couple of responses first, coming yes. in. Uh, personal experiences on the trails. 
And um, let's see, they're coming in pretty fast. From participants at an event. Interviews, staff, and volunteers. Mm -hmm. Social media and charismatic megafauna. Some great ideas. They're all around. Open your eyes. Nature is wonderful. And endangered species and their plights. From the kids on a walk at the refuge. Oh, I love that one. Yep, from visitors, families, friends, when they visit the refuge, especially during or after a visit. And that's the last one for right now. Uh, that all went so fast. Did anyone mention volunteers? They are one of my yes. favorites. Okay, yeah, that's one of my favorite like go tos for stories because you can get um, kind of the the involvement stories that Joan was talking about earlier, and those are just incredible. Open house school visits, yes, mm -hmm. great ideas. Amy, how do how, how do you conduct your interviews, or how do you set that up? Do you just catch them on the fly, or no. do you have a formal process? I'm not a very formal person, Cheryl. Um, I, I tend to, um, if I really want to sit down and have a conversation, we can schedule some time and do that. But a lot of the time it's just in, in conversations. And then I ask if I can capture that and, you know, share it. And most of them are fine. So it's, it's really just building those relationships and feeling comfortable to have those conversations a lot of the time. Kids at fishing there's events, some, yes. There's a pin suggested oral histories are very good for this as well. That's great. Uh, from our open houses and school visits. And kids at first time events such as youth fishing events or owl prowls. Yeah, so a couple other ones, um, companies, foundations who have supported you. Um, people have given you grants if uh, you reach back out and say, you know, why did you support us? That can really garner some other support in the future. And um, like your congressmen and women, if you have one who's really involved with the refuge, asking them why they love you can be a really interesting way to gather some stories. Okay, um, question number yeah. two. Before you, before you move on, Amy, the um, yes. question was asked, any special permission to use stories and or pictures? I don't have any formal process for that either. Maybe I should. Um, I just ask if it's okay to share. Okay. I'm sure that you could formalize that process if you wanted to. See some other things coming in the chat there too. You guys have some great ideas. Are we ready to go on to question two? Sounds good. Okay. Okay, how can you ask for stories or how can you collect stories? How can you collect stories from your group or from your constituents? Amy, why do you think it's important to collect stories? kind of goes back to the basics for social people. Um, it, it makes so much more of an impact when you have individual stories versus always trying to share your own content. <laughs> <laughs> I just, it, it, makes you, it makes people so much more relatable than, um, than not. So, yeah. And Lots I know there's a, yeah, there's a lot of uh, com comments coming in. The videotape, someone yes, or sign signing in books. The, the sign in books at the visitor center, I guess. Mm -hmm. Discussions with I mean, our volunteers. Yeah, that's a great idea. Be present at events, walk the trails, and talk to people. Be social. That's always fun. I mean, I can speak on that. Also, is I hear a lot of stories when I walk the refuge and just mm -hmm. say hello to people, and we hear stories. Informal interviews. Okay, here's one for Amy. Hashtags on social media. I have yet to figure out what a hashtag is, but some people definitely know what that is. So yeah, I am. I will be the first to admit I'm the worst millennial that has ever existed. Um, hashtags and I are not buddies. So we need to have a whole nother webinar on how 
to do those. Great. I'm looking forward to that. Boy, well, maybe uh, Annalise can help us with that webinar. There you go. <laughs> yeah, Lisa. Ken just says, uh, just be interested in everyone you meet at the refuge. They all have stories. Over coffee or tea, any type of food. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, food's a great, bring, uh, brings people together for sure. And even add, added location tags are great. Yeah, that's a great idea too. What Another else? one of those things that some of us don't understand how to use. Yeah. <laughs> So one of the things I've seen some of the refuges start to do because our friends groups are, are you know, a lot of them were started in the 1980s. Um, some of the original founders of those friends groups are now not as heavily involved or have, you know, unfortunately passed away. The importance of capturing, recording, writing down their stories so that your organization has stories about your roots, why your organization was formed, and that you're getting that from one of the founders. Um, so that's why I, I've seen the Friends of Heinz do it, and they've done it very effectively, that hopefully other places are also capturing that story. So just Julie a couple says, of other... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Julie got? says, Julie you're giving says, me a great idea for a quarterly newsletter, so we are... Definitely yes. thinking yes. about it. Go I wanted ahead. to also say that the annual narratives of the refuges used to be very popular for stories too. That's always kind of a nice little story the refuge used to tell on a yearly basis. So our friends group actually, we just like a couple of hours ago finished the final draft of our annual report for the year. It's 32 pages. It is probably way over the top, but all of it is stories. It's stories from refuge staff. It's stories from volunteers. Um, it's it's stories from donors. It's super cool. So check that out at some point too. We'll, we'll have it out in a couple of weeks, but um, that's another great way that you can share your stories. Mm -hmm. um, I, another thing that I thought about, which, um, you know, using technology again, email surveys. If you have like a survey form, you can send out an email, just get some great feedback from your people that way. Um, if you have online donation forms or really if you have like a membership brochure or something that you give people, you can have an ask on there that just says, why did you become a member? Why did you choose to support our group? We get some great feedback that way too. Um, yeah. One and last question. Mention research on refuge. Research on refuges. That's a great one too. So one final question for you, um, kind of bringing it all together so far that we, everything that we've learned today, how can your nonprofit share stories? We've covered you know, a few of these so far, um, but what are some ways that your nonprofit can share your stories with the world? Want me to flip to the next screen? We'll give them a minute and then oh, we'll okay. flip. All right. Mm -hmm. I don't want them distracted by the cartoon. You know, I would be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the first one's come in when talking with visitors. Yeah, those in-person conversations are great. New Reaching letters. out to community organizations, yep, yeah, newsletters. I see reaching out to community groups and one of my experiences is sometimes those community groups have such wonderful stories to tell you about your refuge or hatchery, how that land was perhaps utilized before. And they're fascinating stories. Social media posts. Yeah, social media is a great one. And when we talk about social media, we're talking mostly about Facebook, right? I mean, and Instagram. Social media can be really all encompassing your website, your email content. It's all really social media. But yeah, the obvious ones are Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, if you're into that kind of thing. I have gotten kind of into Facebook and I have an Instagram account, but that is as far as I've gotten with that one. Again, <laughs> worst millennial ever, but the, the te technology exists for you to do all kinds of things on there. 
And and one of the things that we found is, a, um, depending on who the audience is you want to approach, different social media uh, is more utilized by different, shall I say, age groups. Mm-hmm. Facebook is more for us older folk and um, things like TikTok and uh, YouTube and some of those are more utilized by some of the, some of Amy's generation. <laughs> All right. Well, great, great ideas there. Let's go ahead and flip to the next slide if you're ready, Joan. Yep. Um, We wanted to touch on ways that visuals can tell stories too. And um, with those advances in technology, there's tons of outlets out there for friends to engage with your audiences. Um, My first example is social media. So I'm glad to see that that came up. Um, I follow some really awesome friends groups on Facebook, which is primarily the reason that I'm on there. Friends of the Wichita's, DC Booth Hatchery, um, Neil Smith, Friends of Front Range Refuges. I love the bison content on there. Um, Bombay Hook, those are some of my favorites. I think you're all doing a great job. So if you're on here, there's my endorsement. Thank you, you're doing amazing. Um, So real quick, real quick in the chat too, or just raise your hand so we can see it. Let us know if your group uses social media. I gotta flip my screen here so I can see my people. Great. If you don't, there's, I mean, it's a great time to start. There's no reason to not. It's it's usually a free way to promote your refuge. Um, it takes a little bit of time to get rolling, but it's definitely worth that time investment. So my first example of using visuals to tell stories is a post that we put up on Facebook last fall, this post advocates for normalizing native habitats. So in this case, the story is presented or told as a short cartoon um, with an image. The guy says, wow, your yard is so messy with the dead tree and the brushed pile and the plants that have gone to seed. And the lady replies, thanks, it's called habitat. And you can just see her little superhero cape blowing in the background. Um, We used this image and we added in some information um, about why native species are important and a link to our conservation at home page on our website so that people could visit. And this reached 32,000 people like pretty quickly. Audubon societies, individuals, other refuges and friends groups shared it. And while I can't tell you exactly what those 32,000 people did with the information, I can tell you that in terms of reach, this post was effective. The interesting thing about storytelling on social media is that um, anyone who shares your content can type up their own text and add to their story from yours. Um, One of our followers did that and further impacted her circle of friends by introducing us to that, or introducing them to our content. And she said, This is an environmental movement I can get behind. It doesn't involve spending more money. It involves less work. Let people coexist with you in a small way. And if enough people do it, it will be in a big way. I mean, that's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. We inspired someone to advocate for conservation with a cartoon and a paragraph of text. So um, the ask in this case was just to learn more about clicking on our conservation at home link. But what they do from there could really extend the conservation impact on a big scale. My second example, if you wanna go ahead and advance there, Joan, is storytelling using videos. For the sake of time, I'm not gonna play these for you, but um, the top video shows aspects of what refuge staff do and why they do it. It also highlights our intern program and showcases some of the cool projects that interns get involved with. In this case, um, it's highlighting nest count surveys on Westchester Island, which is Ohio's only federally designated wilderness area someplace that very, very few people get to go to. So we sent our three interns out with a GoPro and a chest harness and said, go have fun, shoot what you do. And they had a blast and came back with tons of footage that I could use and splice together and add in some text comments to um, really show what's happening on the refuge and how the interns are making an an impact. And then we shared that on YouTube and in an e-newsletter. The bottom video is storytelling to kind of close that fundraising feedback loop. Um, We ask for money for a project, we raise our goal, and then ideally we would have donors come back and see what we did with it. But if they live far away or if there's a never ending pandemic, we can create a video to show what we did with their gifts. 
And this kind of video just helps to instill trust in what we do and that we say that we're, that what we say we're going to do is what we're actually doing with our funds. Um, we've also done several fundraising videos featuring Puddles of Blue Goose and one featuring volunteers with quotes about why they volunteer. And um, those are all up on YouTube. You can really do a lot with videos, spreading awareness, asking for support, saying thank you. Um, just tons of opportunity there with visuals and storytelling. On to outcomes and measures. So um, I think everybody probably has realized by now that, that what we're trying to get across when it comes to storytelling is that all communication, um, including storytelling, should be strategic in nature. So think in advance, begin with the end in mind is what Covey would say. Uh, think in advance what areas of your organization you're trying to influence and then what stories would match up well with that um, and taking it one step further on the on the measurements or how effective was that um, be prepared to go to the different um, people who would have that information about whether or not the story really hit home so if you're trying to influence members talk with your membership chair um, before you tell the story and then again after you tell the story to see if it in fact increased the members. Um, and on and on down the list that we've got here, um, if you're trying to influence volunteers, get with your volunteer liaison. If you're trying to influence the amount of dollars you receive from donors, then be sure that you're talking um, and, and regularly communicating with your finance committee chair um, at, on and on down the road. I will say that you also need to be prepared um, for some effectiveness overlap because some of these stories will hit um, people's emotions in a way that will spur them to action in several different areas. Um, and be prepared for unintended consequences as well. We recently told a story with a visual um, on the refuge of an elk uh, chewing on an antler shed. And our communication about it was why antler shed hunting is um, not permitted on the refuge. Um, that particular post, and it was on all three of our social media platforms, so we do uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, on Facebook alone, it hit 3.1 million people uh, because of the amount of comments that we got. Some people didn't understand that um, the calcium in an antler shed would be consumed by other animals on the refuge. Uh, some people thought it was a staged photo. So there were definitely a lot of, um, no, that can't be real. It's photoshopped uh, in there in the comments, but there were also an overwhelming amount of, no, this is real guys. And this is a great example of why we preserve the habitat in its most pristine form. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, so we um, uh, want to open this up for, for further discussion and I'm going to stop the slides, but I do want you to know, and this will be up on the Corfu website, some resources that Amy shared and all that, um, are available to help with your efforts in storytelling. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the share so we can see everyone again. And have I done that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, miracles are happening again today. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, at this point, you can either put comments in the chat or raise your hand. Hopefully we'll be able to see those hands raised. If people have additional information that they would like to share or bounce ideas off of uh, off of the group, go for it. 
Joan, excuse me, but before before we get into the discussion part, I'm wondering if before maybe some people have to leave, if uh, Sue wants to talk about the what's coming up in the next month. Yes, so we're gonna we're gonna put this work that we've been talking about this uh, webinar into action, and our next steps uh, will start as early as next week. We're gonna have a series of sharing sessions that we're talking about where we're all gonna to get together. Um, we're hoping to hear from many friends groups around the country. Um, we've, had, we've identified three different times uh, for the sessions in the next three weeks. They're gonna be called sharing sessions. And the idea is that we all have one message that we all share as friends of refuges and hatcheries. And that is that we're seeing a tremendous impact from the reduced budgets that are being put forth for our, our beautiful refuges and hatcheries. So we wanna use that as our theme for starting to gather information about stories we can tell um, our representatives and share with our local communities about the impacts we're seeing on, on from the budgets. So please join us starting the 25th at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern time, we're trying to do a lot of different times so we can capture some of the folks that might be working or not able to make these uh, two o'clock webinars. And we just wanna hear your stories. So come to the sessions uh, with the ideas that you can tell us about the greatest impacts you're seeing from your friends organizations. I know I have stories to tell from Southeast Louisiana where I am. And uh, so we'd like you to be prepared with what some impacts you're seeing are. And then the second thing is, what is one thing you would tell your representative um, that you would like him to, him or her or, or your local community to know about these impacts? So please join us starting next week, the 25th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And we will be putting an invitation out within the hour for that. We wanted to kind of do it in two different steps. And even drop the link in the chat if you want to click Perfect. on that. That will take you to the invitation and the information about the dates and time. So now I'll butt out and Joan can turn it back to you. And I'm going to just say one more thing about that. Part of the reason for these listening sessions, too, in, in addition to being able to identify those issues that are impacting your refuge or hatchery, we also would want to hear what sort of resources do you as a friends organizations need in order to be able to effectively communicate with your members of Congress? So is, is there something that we need to pull together collectively or just what is needed? Okay, so that's another important thing from the sharing sessions. So speaking of sharing, um, any... Okay. Comments Joan, discussion? There yes. is a comment in the in the chat. It would be nice to share some examples of friends groups who have good examples of these things like Amy was sharing or have a, in a resource filter, if sorry, resource folder, examples of annual appeal, annual report, Instagram posts, YouTube videos, and so on. Maybe that's something that we should start gathering. Yeah. That would that. be Great, and it's something that we could put in the resource center of uh, the Corfo website. Absolutely, I right. yeah, can do that. Chinese head shaking. Yes, okay. Yeah, we'll reach out to you for some help with it. And we have a hand up, Melanie. From I I'm in Alaska, so all the times are different for me. But my mm -hmm. question is, some people uh, there are some people on our board who look at social media um, as kind of like, oh, that's a waste of time. You need to write, a, I mean, and I believe in letters as well, but some people just in general look at social media posts as a waste of time. Why are you wasting your time on that? Is there a, a fair, nice response to that? You know, our social media uh, posts reach thousands of people that we don't normally have as members. Exactly. Members yeah. of the local community. So I, I I think that it could be a valuable tool if it's done right. Mm -hmm. That's my and that's, take on that's it. That's definitely, I mean, I can, even showing them numbers sometimes. Like, mm. So, you know, I, I guess it just, yeah. 
Hey, Eden, I hate to put you on the spot, but you do a lot of social media for the Refuge Association. What do you see as the value? Yeah, so I would agree and echo with what Sue said that, you know, you may be reaching a good amount of people through local newspapers and, you know, modern, um, I guess, uh, traditional media, um, you know, having newscasts and different things like that, reaching out to your local news. Um, but if you are on social media, you are probably reaching a little bit more of a diverse audience um, by many different ways, um, you know, more people who are younger um, that may not be watching the news or like reading a newspaper anymore. Um, so you are definitely tapping into a different audience than you normally would be um, by reaching out to social media. And I also like to think that, you know, social media is a lot more adopted today than it was even five years ago. And, um, you know, if you, I always like to say, if like you don't kind of just try now, you're going to fall behind. So even if you're a little scared or your board's a little bit of scared to use it, um, you know, even just spending like an hour on it a week, I think can be yeah. beneficial. So yeah, I agree a hundred percent. I just wish I could like had, yeah. Cause when I started in three years, we've gone to like, from like 280 Facebook likes to 3000, you know, mm -hmm. and know that people are, and you know, in all of this stuff, people, we are reaching different people and they are responding. And I guess just maybe if there, if anybody knows of a tool to, in addition to showing those numbers, um, a tool to like gather, yes, I took this action because I saw that, you know, some way to demonstrate it to those hesitant people. I don't know if there is one. I, I have a story on uh, social media that's real and it's just last fall. We had the walk for the wild and- uh, Yeah, you guys rocked it. And in that, uh, our we had a, pretty good turnout and one third of our turnout, we were able to trace back that they came from social media. That's how they found out about it. So that's a real life example. And it enabled us to tap a younger audience than we normally had for our friends group. So uh, we have appointed a younger member of the board to be in charge of our social media program. I'll have you come talk to my board, Kenneth. <laughs> Thank you. And did you have a question or another comment? You had your hand up. That was my comment. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands or messages in the chat. Yeah, there's a concern about the recording and this will be recorded. So um, it will be made available through uh, either your, your response to the Refuge Association email or uh, we'll post it on Facebook in the Corpo Facebook page. And, it's, so and our webinar, recordings of our webinars are always available on the, in the Resource Center on right. the website. Corpo website. Other comments or input that you'd like to share with other members of the Friends community on how you're reaching people? Could I just uh, jump yes, in Mitch? and uh, talk about what Melanie was saying about persuading people to kind of get on board the um, social media monster, if you will? Um, mm -hmm. Yes, I agree with, with Amy that it, it's, it's, I'm a pretty terrible millennial myself, and I don't even like to use that term. I'm Gen Y. Um, but the um, you know, I, I see social media as kind of a necessary evil these days, um, but that's that's my personal opinion. But the way I kind of um, like to, if you have especially older people who are kind of um, unfamiliar with it and unsure about it, an easy way that you can kind of explain it is, is you can just look back in history uh, that in the early days of the Park Service, when public lands were not really a thought of thing, um, no one knew about Yellowstone or Yosemite, those areas out west, uh, especially the, the DC lawmakers. So, you know, it wasn't until that stories were shared back, that photographs were carried back from these lands and shared um, in DC that, that policies were enacted and a change uh, took place. And so all you can, you know, you can take that, that lesson and apply it to today that, um, you're essentially doing the same thing. You're taking a, a picture, um, but instead of 
keeping it on say a newspaper platform or you know carrying it to dc you can actively share it with all of these other people uh, you can tap into millions of, of audiences across the country and across the world i um, and especially you know out, out in alaska not many people are going to go to those those refuges or um, even visit that state so the ability to share what's happening locally across the world instantly um, is a, a pretty powerful tool um, i will say for the insights um, especially on instagram um, if you cross a threshold of a um, 100 followers you can upgrade your account for free to like a business account and it gives you access to all of the metrics um, so you can see exactly which posts are doing well um, what the reach is you know what the interactions are you can get metrics on um, age groups um, all, all the all the little things that would be very helpful um, you know where most of your followers live uh, that kind of a thing uh, so it's it is that kind of necessary evil but it can be a very powerful tool so that's kind of how i would suggest maybe getting some of uh, the people that don't necessarily want to commit to it on board thank you so matthew it sounds like from instagram you can get a whole lot more information about the followers than you could from facebook yeah, and so I'm not entirely positive about the uh, Facebook metrics. I know that there are some um, for your page. Um, I'm not as familiar with Facebook. I'm more familiar with Instagram. Um, but uh, yeah, you can, um, like I said, it's I think it's called a business account, but it's it's free. Um, as long as you reach that threshold of 100 followers, uh, you can just switch it over on the platform um, and it automatically like it'll tell you it, you know, a new button appears for you, not for anybody else, but you can see it uh, when you sign in. Um, and yeah, you can tap into all kinds of uh, really interesting metrics. Um, and then of course you can also go and uh, target your ads if you're trying to promote a post um, and you can type in a very specific reach, people who are interested in photography, people who are interested in environmentalism, who are based in whatever state, whatever city, um, and they'll show you how many people you know, appro you know approximately you're going to reach, um, and you can just target um, specific people. Uh, so it's very powerful. I mean, it's one of those you, know, you were only getting a little bit back from what Facebook and you know and um, all these other social platforms are getting from us because we are uh, the product. So they have all this uh, information anyways, and it's just giving us a little bit of access to it, um, you know, for free. Um, and, uh, but you know, you can use it to your advantage, you know, a small budget can go a long way. Okay. Oh, Thank you. Yeah. That's I just want to say we had a really good laugh about the Facebook analytics. So you can actually, if you have a business page, you get a set of analytics that go with your Facebook page. Yeah. So our, pre our president, um, who's always posting on Facebook, um, we, we looked at those analytics and it turns out that a certain age of women followers were uh, following our president pretty closely uh, just, and, and so we just thought, thought that was really funny that, you know, ladies from 70 to 50 to 70 just thought our president would, every time he posted something, they liked it. So, I mean, it can be pretty powerful. Cindy and then they're also from, you can also tell what local communities are from, like Matthew was saying. And so we know now that our biggest audience is actually in a particular community that we didn't really realize before we had the Facebook post and looked at the analytics of the page. Melanie, the only other thing uh, thought that I had for you is that if you've not gone to look up the social media platforms for your lawmakers, um, that might be a great way to um, Shift like an example perspective yeah yeah i agree with all that it's just there's just uh, cindy put cindy put <laughs> in the chat most of the parents who bring their children to our youth programs say that they yeah. learned about it on facebook page i agree i agree with all of this it's just a matter of you just have to get the message to the rest of the board <laughs> yeah there's there's one in particular so I hate to ignore anyone. Well, just keep keep up trying. 
I almost yeah. wonder if you take some of the information that we talked about here today and then had a conversation with your board to work together to craft some kind of social media strategy, like maybe just having the involvement and um, having those discussions might get you where you want to be. It's a good reason to have diversity on your board, including age. Yes, I agree. We're working on that. That's happening. But yeah, it's, I mean, and I'm not complaining. I mean, not putting anybody down or whatever. And I understand their point, just not comfortable with it. But yeah. Another comment in the chat on um, from Marco on social media, having hashtags and tagging specific people such as reporters and elected officials can be very effective. For sure. Sounds like we might need a webinar on this. I think I think some of us learn, so. need to learn yeah. hashtags. <laughs> yeah, I would love to learn how to use a hashtag, especially since my grandkids know and they're only four and five. So, <laughs> yeah. I think we have some resources here that we can tap. And Facebook will suggest them sometimes, depending on what your post is. Mm -hmm. to, yeah, if you go into the business suite, sometimes it'll suggest some, which is nice to, to learn some that, oh, I didn't know that was a thing. Okay, anything else? I don't see any more hands raised and I don't see any more comments on chat. I have just one more question. Question for the group, and is anyone effectively using TikTok? I didn't think so, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's certain yeah. groups on, on the on the call that can't answer that question, but yeah. Yeah, there there have been many conversations about um, if we're trying to reach audiences where they are, do we need to use TikTok to reach the younger ones? And I just can't quite get there. So this is validating. Thank you. That's if you're ever on, we don't use it, but if you're ever on there, the um, bird treatment learning center in Alaska does use it on occasion, and it's it's really fun and great to see theirs. Yeah, I have mixed feelings about TikTok as well. You get a very uh, a, an all caps with an explanation exclamation point after it. No, from Dan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I was going to say the the challenging thing about TikTok is is really formulating the content. I would say um you know creating a 30 to 1 minute and 30 second video every day is challenging I think for a lot of people and taking a picture is a lot simpler. So that's why I do think Instagram is probably still Instagram and Facebook are probably still the best for refuges right now. But that's just my yeah, <laughs> blanket, blanket assessment. <laughs> Well, Instagram skews so young anyways. Um, yeah, and they have reels. Yeah, it's, right. Yeah, it, it, if you really don't have the um, the mindset to put forth a very strong voice in those videos, I, I would just probably leave it alone. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's very, you have to be super authentic to your brand and your, your image. And um, especially on a group that maybe there's not just one person in charge of your social media platform, there might be other voices. That would be really hard to maintain a consistent voice. Um, Instagram is a little bit more forgiving and it's more easily uh, shareable anyways. And then yeah, with stories, you're basically sharing video, you can share videos anyways. Um, and then yeah, the, the older the platform is, the older the age group it kind of skews towards. So then Facebook, it's more for the long form. You can really get a lot of good, good information. Um, it's less image based. It's just more information based. Um, so I think, yeah, the, those two platforms at the moment are still the, uh, the dominant ones for getting the word out. I think we're going to need a social media webinar. I think it's still coming. <laughs> 
Yeah. yeah, I think I think Matthew maybe might we might need to hit Matthew up for some training. <laughs> Thanks, Matthew. I don't know about that one, <laughs> I, but I can help. Oh, we got Matthew and Eden and yeah, and, and Amy. Goodness, we could Amy. learn a lot. See how you volunteered me for that one. Yep. <laughs> like doing that. I think that's paid. in public, even in public. I know, I know. It makes it official. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So we will add that to the list. Um, hey, so some of the upcoming webinars, just so you guys know, as Sue described, the, the sharing sessions. And then um, in February, and I don't remember the date. Um, uh, 15th, February 15th. 15th. Yep, Andy is Robinson, our Wednesday webinar. Okay, Andy Robinson's going to be doing a webinar on board recruitment. He is a nonprofit consultant that has worked with a number of friends groups and um, worked with the refuge system in the past. So board recruitment. And then in March, it's going to be about insurance and risk assessment. And then at some point, we will also be seeing social media. So, okay. Um, anything else people want to share before we close out the session? Oh, another idea for a social media person. Okay. Great. Thank Great, you. Brett. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ken. All right. Well, thank you everybody for taking the time this afternoon. And I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, please just let us know. Um, you can email Corfa and um, go to our website for our email address because I can't remember it right now. And it's in the chat. It's in the chat. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha.